Hello everyone, this is going to be section 2.6 in continuity. So first, the graph of many functions uh, contains no holes, jumps, or breaks. If we have a function L equals f of t, uh, that represents the length of a fish t years after it is hatched, then the length of the fish change gradually as t increases. Consequently, the graph of L has no breaks. Similarly, uh, if you create a function L for the length of um, your road um, from children to adulthood, then you're going to see that that also has no breaks. And uh, we're going to have some type of behavior like this. is is going to go uh, with respect to time. It's going to be constantly be growing and it's not going to have interruptions up to a certain point in time. Then uh, we also have uh, functions that are not going to be continuous. Um, for example, if we have the cost in dollars of parking in a certain place for a certain number of minutes, then for example, 15 minutes is going to be a quarter, 30 minutes is going to be two quarters, 45 minutes is going to be um, three quarters, and uh, one hour is going to be an entire dollar. Okay? But uh, we can see that uh, each of the pieces is uh, a quite a big of a jump and we have clearly a discontinuity in here because there's breaks uh, between each of the pieces. Informally, we can say that a function f is continuous at a point A if the graph of f does not have a hole or a break at A. So that means if the graph near can be drawn without lifting the pencil. Okay. Now the informal description of continuity is sufficient for determining the continuity of simple function, but it's not as precise enough to deal with more complicated functions. So for example, look at this function that I have in the screen. The function h of x equals x sine of 1 over f x if x is different from 0 and 0 if x is equal to 0. So it, just by looking, it's impossible to check if x is continuous to 0 or not, because we cannot see far enough to see if there is a, dex, uh, if there is a disconnection or not in here. Now, the definition of continuity of a point then is given, as uh, we've mentioned before, by making the delimit is exactly the same as what the def what the function is defining the point, but for this to happen, there's a lot of things that need to that need to happen first. So first, the limit needs to exist. So um, the limit has to be the same for both sides, on the left and the on the right side of a point, and uh, our function has to be defined in that point, and then these two things has to be equal. Okay. So the continuity of a point is defined at that limit, but that is split in these three conditions. First, f of a is defined and exists in the domain of, uh, of the function. The limit exists, so that means uh, right side and, and left side coincides, and then these uh, two things are equal. Okay, so first the two things that need to exist, there, uh, they need to be equal. So let's take a look at what happens in um, a graphical point of view. So very quickly, if we have this graph over here, uh, this function is going from the interval 0 to 7, uh, we can tell at uh, which point the function is not continuous. Clearly, it's not continuous at 0 because it doesn't exist, it has a hole. It's not continuous at 1 because there's a break, there's a hole in there, so this, the function is not continuous in there. It's not continuous at 1 because the limit differs from the definition of the function. The definition of the function is 3, but the limit is giving you 1. On uh, 3, there is a discontinuity as well. The definition of the function does not coincide with the limit, mainly because the limit does not exist. Notice that uh, by the left side, the limit is going to 2. By the right side, the limit is going to 1. And uh, the definition of the function in 3 is 1. So it only coincides with the left side, but sorry, with the right side here. Okay? So we don't have a, a continuity going on in here. 
Now in five is even uh, easier to see because we have an asymptote in there going on. And so there's a break. We can't see where the function is going. It's probably going to infinity, but there's not a smooth transition going on in here. Finally, the point uh, x equals seven is also not continuous. Uh, as you can see, the function is not defined in there and uh, there's no limit uh, coming from uh, the right side. Okay, so uh, mainly we can talk about uh, these continuities in one, two, three, and five because the graph uh, contains holes or breaks at each of these locations. Now, in the particular case of zero and seven, uh, there might be the discussion about uh, continuity from one side. So continuity from the left or continuity from the right, or they're the starting points and they're not really included in the domain. So C and seven, they're not included in the domain. So it's fine. They don't really belong to the domain. Okay. But if they did, then um, probably it wouldn't be continuous in there. Now, let's do the same thing, but analyzing that from the point of view of a function with a rule. So let's assume that we have the function 3x squared plus 2x plus 1 over x minus 1, uh, and we want to check if it's continuous at the point a equals 1. First, we immediately can know that this is not going to be continuous in here because there is a problem in the domain at 1. Okay, So this is either going to be a hole or it's going to be an asymptote, one of the two. Likely here is going to be an asymptote, so because there is a break, there's no continuity in there. Now, same function, but with a equals two. It doesn't seem to have an issue. The top and the bottom, they don't depend on two. They don't have problems at two. So we're gonna say, yes, this is continuous. It has no issues at two. Finally, we have the function f of x um, equals x sine of one over x, x different from zero, and zero if x is equal to zero. This is actually the function that we just described a little bit ago. And um, we want to check if it's continuous to zero. Here, uh, the choker is going to be that, yes, that function is going to be continuous at zero. And uh, let me prove it to you. So this is x sine of one over x, uh, x different from zero, and zero if x is equal to zero. So by definition, f of zero is zero. Now, on the other hand, we have the sine of one over x is between minus one and one. So x sine over x, x sine of one over x is between minus x and minus x and x. And uh, when we take a limit when x goes to zero of minus x, this is gonna be the same limit when x goes to zero of x. So this is zero. So this means that the limits on these streams are going to zero. So by a squeeze theorem, this is actually going to zero. And so since this is going to zero, that means that is equals to f of zero. And uh, we have the two the conditions of continuity. This is the first condition. This is the second condition. And the third condition is here. Okay, they're equal at the very end. All right, moving on. So this function is actually going to be continuous at x equals zero. Now let's see some continuity rules. If f and g are continuous functions at a, then the following uh, functions are also going to be continuous at a. Uh, we're going to assume that c is a constant and n is a positive integer. Turns out that if f and g are continuous at a point, the sum, the subtraction, the product, they're going to be continuous as well. The multiplication by a scalar is going to be continuous as well, and any power is going to be continuous as well. Now the quotient is going to be continuous as well, provided that it doesn't transform the denominator in zero. Okay, so it's not a zero of the denominator. Now with that, it's natural to think about polynomial functions 
uh, and rational functions. So polynomial functions, they don't have an, any issue in the domain. They're bare continuous everywhere. If you see the graph of a polynomial, you just see that they bounce up and down, but they're continuous. You can trace uh, the, the graph of a polynomial without lifting your pencil. Rational function now uh, is from the form p over q, where p and q are polynomials. So normally, being p and q polynomials are continuous, but now we gotta be careful and just check that we're not getting the zeros of q. So because q is a polynomial, it's gonna have some zeros, and so what we want is, okay, the function, the rational function is gonna be continuous where I don't have a zero on the denominator. Now, an example of this will be the function f of x over x squared minus 7x plus 12. Notice that this function, uh, x squared minus 7x plus 12, it has a zero in three and it has a zero in four, okay? So uh, in here, uh, that means that those particular points are going to represent asymptotes in here because there are zeros of the denominator, and we can um, and we can um, we can cancel with anything on the top. So uh, this function is going to be continuous everywhere, as you can see from the graph, except in those particular points three and four. Now let's talk about continuity of a composite function in a point. So if g is a function that is continuous at a and f is continuous at g of a, whatever that value is, then the composite function f composed g is continuous at a. Okay? And uh, thanks to that, if g is continuous at a and f is continuous at g of a, then we can do interchanging of limits. This is something that we used before for calculation of limits with things like the roots and the powers and sine functions and exp exponential functions. So anything that we can use that is composed with a continuous function, then we can put the limit inside without issues. Now, um, continuity at endpoints. So a function f can be defined as continuous from the right or right continuous if the limit by the right side of f of x when x goes to a is equals to f of a. And f is continuous from the left or left continuous at b if f going to uh, b by the left of f of x is equals f of b. So essentially the definition of continuity but weaker. And here we're just, we're just saying on one side the conditions for continuity hold and especially if they're endpoints, then we're fine with that, okay? So just as an example of this, we have this function f of x that is defined in the interval a, b. Uh, we can say that this is right continuous at a. Notice that a is included on the domain, and the limit when we're approaching by the right side is equals to f of a. So in this case, we can say that it's continuous, right continuous at a. Similarly, in here, uh, we're going to have the function g defined on the interval a open, b close. So because b is uh, contained in the domain and in the interval and is going to be equals to the limit, then we're going to consider this left continuous. Now, with that idea, let's talk about continuity on an interval. A function f is continuous in an interval if it is continuous for all the points i of that interval. If i contains the endpoints, continuity on the interval means that it continues from the right or left at the endpoints. Okay. So let's see one example here. We have this function y equals f of x, and we have this function um, which is going to be continuous from minus infinity to zero. As you can see over here, this is continuous and here is going to be continuous by the left side at zero. Now, uh, on, on this side, we're going to have that this function is continuous from zero open to infinity. Okay, you can see this line is continue 
from 0 to infinity, and we're going to say that this is left continuous at x equals 0. Why? Because when we approach, um, when we approach by the left side, then um, the limit here, um, the limit here is approaching um, the definition of the limit. Okay. Although if you check in here, uh, the definition of the function in here does not coincide in this, so it really isn't continuous in zero. Okay. We can we can talk about right continuity. And um, we can talk about left continuous here at x equals zero, but we cannot talk about right continuous and we cannot talk about regular continuity. Now, um, we can extend the idea of continuity of functions with the roots, in particular because in uh, whatever n is a power, then if n is a positive integer and n is an odd integer, then the function f of x power to 1 over n is continuous at all points uh, where the function f is continuous. Now, if n is even, f of x power to the 1 over n is continuous at all points at which f is continuous and positive. That makes sense because otherwise you will have it wouldn't be defined on the interval. So just as an example of that, uh, we use the function g of x um, square root of nine minus x square. This function is only defined wherever nine minus x square is positive. So that's, this is going to be pretty much the interval minus three to three, and it's gonna be given by this graph, okay? Outside of minus three to three, this function isn't really defined. So we don't even talk about continuity where it's not defined. Clearly is um, right continuous at minus three because when we're approaching minus three, the limits coincide with the function. And if less, it is left continuous at x equals three because when we're approaching uh, three by the left, it coincides with the function as well in the limit. Now, um, we can in general talk about uh, continuity for an um, immense amount of functions. Trigonometric functions are going to be uh, one of the most um, typical functions where we are interested in checking what are the continuity intervals. Uh, the sine of x is going to be continuous over his whole domain. The cosine of x is going to be similarly uh, defined and continuous over the whole domain. Um, the tangent um, and other functions like the cotangent, they're going to be defined and continuous. And there's small domain where they're one to one and where they don't have um, points going to infinity. They're going to be continuous in open intervals. And um, by the definition, uh, where they are one to one, these functions, these trigonometric functions, they have inverse. Uh, so in general, we can think that if a function is continuous in an interval and it has an inverse in that interval, then the inverse is also going to be continuous. And thanks to that, then um, the following functions are continuous at all points on their domains. And be careful about this, on their domains. So all the trigonometric functions, sine, cosine, tangent, cotangent, secant, cosecant, and um, their inverse sine to the minus one, cosine to the minus one, tangent to the minus one, cotangent to the minus one, secant to the minus one, and cosecant to the minus one. Also, the exponential and log function. And uh, again, this is tied to their particular domains. So for example, the logs, they only exist from zero to infinity. So in that domain, they're continuous. Um, the tangent is only good between minus pi half to pi half open, and in that interval is continuous. Now, to finalize uh, this section, let's talk about the intermediate value theorem. So the intermediate value theorem says that if you have two points connected by a continuous function, then any point that is going to be in the middle is going to be reached at some point by the function. So this can be um, this can be rewarded as uh, if you have a function that is continuous in a b, 
and L is a number between f of A and f of B, then there is at least going to be one number C in the open interval so that f of C is that number L. And so that makes more sense if I probably show you in a graph. So let me just um, give you the general idea. So intermediate value theorem. So we have a function and let's say, um, let's say we have f of a here and f of b here and we have a and b here. So what's going on is if this is a continuous function, I have the definition of f of a in here and I have the definition of f of b here. And so, because it's continuous, if I'm looking for a number here in the middle, L, because the function is continuous, then this point has to be connected to this. So that means it does this, it can be, it can be doing that. And so there is going to be certain certain number so that um, if L has an image here in the function, and I'm gonna be able to trace back to certain point C. And so um, C or F of C is going to be L. And so that gives me a lot of information um, with continuous function. I, I, can, um, I can tell you at some point, I'm going to definitely reach this quantity. And so with that, I can look back to when that quantity is going to occur. And so that's specifically good for uh, many applications. Now, um, if the function is not continuous, that might not happen. Notice, notice the, the case in here. I have this function and f of a is here, f of b is here. I have l in the middle, but if the function is discontinuous, then there is not going to be a number such that f of c is l. Now let's see an application of this. So you invest a thousand dollars in a five year savings account with a fixed annual interest rate R with monthly compounding. So the amount of money A in the account after five years or 60 months is going to be given by the formula A, a of R uh, equals a thousand, uh, one plus R divided by 12 uh, power to the 60. And so this, this is the function uh, in terms of the interest rate. So um, if I want to have 1400 in the account after five years, what is the interest rate that I need? Okay. And so what I do with this is I'm going to try and figure out back what is the interest rate that I need. And so because this function is continuous, then I can um, use the graph of the function. I can start from zero, and then I can go ahead and um, think about it after um, a long time. And I, I'm gonna check with, when is this going to be 1400? And if this is going to be 1400 at the 60 months, what is the R that I need? It turns out that uh, using, um, using logs, log functions to uh, find who R is, I can actually go back and check that this is going to be an interest rate of 0 0.06. Uh, and, and, and it's important because I know that at some point by continuity of the function, this is going to pass that line uh, certainly. So I just need to find out um, one rate that is going to work out for that. Okay. And so this is um, one example of how to use that. Uh, another example of this um, will be for finding zeros. Okay. So let's assume that you have F is continuous and you have that F of A is a positive value but you have that f of b is a negative value. Notice that this is what happening. I have a in here, b in here. So I have a is this and b is this. So because of continuity, I know that the function does this. Well, this last part went wrong. 
but it's going to eventually cross. So there's going to be a point C, so that is going to be a zero. So assist C, so that F of C is equal to zero. And so the utility of this is that it's going to help me out to find zeros of the function.